Welcome to today's police fatality public fact-finding review concerning the death of Keith Childress on December 31st, 2015. I'm Craig Drummond. I will be presiding over today's proceeding. This review is being held because the Clark County District Attorney's Office has made a preliminary determination that no criminal prosecution of the officers involved in the death of Mr. Childress is appropriate. Clark County Ordinance Chapter 2.12 requires a public review following such a determination. This is not a trial. The purpose of today's proceeding is to present the public with the essential facts surrounding the death of Mr. Childress. Chief Deputy District Attorney Giancarlo Pesci will present today's fact-finding review on behalf of the District Attorney's Office. He will determine the witnesses or witness to be called. The ordinance does not provide subpoena power on my behalf and does not allow for any other parties to call witnesses. Mr. Josh Tomshek has been appointed to be the ombudsman. He represents both the public and Mr. Childress family. He will have the full opportunity to ask questions of the witness or witnesses. The procedure for questioning witnesses will be informal with a view to providing the public with relevant information regarding the use of force, and the rules of evidence will not be strictly enforced. Members of the public reviewing this review may submit proposed written questions and forms that are located at the back of the room on the chair and present it to one of the officers. Just simply hold up the form and one of the officers will come and grab it. Mr. Tomshek will then review those questions. I will ask all questions unless I determine that they are irrelevant, redundant, or an, abu or an abuse of the review process. At the conclusion of this review, no formal determination is made regarding the manner or cause of death, and a formal determination will not be rendered. I note that there are children today present. This is a public review. Members of the public are willing and able, excuse me, are able to attend. I will leave it to the parents' discretion because some graphic material may be presented during this proceeding and I'm just trying to give everyone a heads up to that information. Do either of the parties have anything to add? No. No. Mr. Pesci, please feel free to call your first witness. Thank you. Detective, what do you do for a living? I'm a detective with Las Vegas Metropolitan Police De Department in the Force Investigation Team. Were you a part of the investigation that occurred on December 31st, 2015? involving the shooting that occurred on Gilded Crown Court. Yes, I was. Tell us about that investigation. <clears throat> this is an officer-involved shooting that happened on December 31st, 2015. The address, again, was 8335 um, Gilded Crown Court. This is an overhead uh, Google map of the area. It's near De Durango Drive and Desert Inn Road. The incident began uh, as a foot pursuit uh, after the U.S. Marshals attempted custody of Keith Childress in the Monaco Park Apartments at 8350 West Desert Inn. And then the top flag shows where the officer-involved shooting took place on Gilded Crown Court. This is a closer view of the um, of where the officer-involved shooting took place, near the intersection of Maple Valley and Gilded Crown, the OIS at showing the house at 8335 Gilded Crown Court. This is a crime scene photograph of the residence of the uh, Gilded Crown. The uh, officer involved shooting happening just near the doorway of the, of the house, just off of the front um, of the double uh, two-car garage. When do our involved officers for this, these are the officers that uh, fired rounds, Sergeant Robert Bohannon and Officer Blake Walford. Sergeant Bohannon's weapon that he used was a Glock 21 45 caliber. It had a magazine capacity of 13 rounds, and uh, during the countdown and evidence revealed that he fired four rounds. Officer Walford's weapon, six hour 226, nine millimeter, a magazine capacity of 18 rounds, and the countdown and evidence revealed that he fired five rounds. There were two Witness officers, and they'll be referred to as Deputy U.S. Marshal Number One and Deputy U.S. Marshal Two. They were uh, next to Officer Walford and Sergeant Bohannon when the shots were fired. Our decedent, 
is Keith Childress, Jr. His uh, date of birth in 1992 and his last known address in Phoenix, Arizona. Childress's injuries, uh, he had uh, five impacts. Uh, one was a through and through. The one in his rest, wrist was the one that was went through and through. Autopsy was conducted by Dr. Jennifer Cornell the next day, January 1st, 2016. Uh, the cause of death was gunshot wounds, uh, her determination, and the manner of death was homicide. Toxicology was done as a matter of course for the autopsy and, and there was none detected in reportable levels. Go through Childress's address, uh, excuse me, arrest history. Uh, this information is from the uh, Phoenix P Police Department on 3-3 three, three of 2013, Childress and three others were involved in a home invasion and were identified, and they identified themselves as bounty hunters. They forced their way into the residence at gunpoint. They took medical marijuana card, computers, electronic equipment, phones, and weapons from the victims that were inside the residence. And one of the victims was able to identify one of the suspects, and sub subsequently all four were arrested during their invest Phoenix Police Department's uh, uh, investigation. Continuing during the search after they were arrested, uh, Childress's, Keith Childress's room, items from the home invasion were located and recovered. Childress went to trial uh, and uh, failed to appear for the verdict that was on 12 17, 2015. And the arrest. Just let me stop you just for one second. If we go back to that last slide so it's clear. So we were reviewing the defendant's criminal history, and that pertains to this particular shooting because we're about to hear about warrants that were issued for his arrest, correct? Correct. So it's very clear the defendant actually went to trial. A trial was held in Arizona. Yes. At the conclusion of the evidence, it was time for the verdict, and at that point is when uh, Mr. Childress did not come to court. That's correct. He had been present throughout the trial. That's correct. And when he did not appear for the actual verdict, uh, subsequent to that, warrants were issued for his arrest. That's correct. All right. Even though he did not appear, it was the verdict rendered. Yes, it was. And was he and the others uh, found guilty? Yes, they were. Thank you. The arrest warrants were uh, issued on 12-17-2015 for failure to appear. As a result of this case, there were uh, uh, burglary in the first degree, two counts of armed robbery, two counts of kidnapping, two counts of aggravated assault, and two counts of theft on all uh, felony charges. FIT investigation from the force investigation team. Uh, this began after the officer involved shooting. And this information was uh, um, from a uh, phone conversation with Childress's mother, Danielle Stagel. Uh, the warrants were from the same case that his brother was charged on and currently serving nine years for. And she stated that Childress left Arizona to avoid going to prison. Uh, Childress was convicted and sentenced for 23 years on the case. Also, a phone conversation with Renee Lott, uh, Danielle Stagel's friend. Ch uh, Childress stated that he was not going to, to, to do the 23 years and was tired of running. Timeline, this timeline goes through from the uh, uh, March of 2013. Again, the three, uh, Childress and the three committed the home invasion in Phoenix. All the suspects carried up firearms. Childress was arrested and charged. And he quit appearing for court, and all four suspects were tried and convicted during this, this case. And on 12-17-2015, uh, an arrest warrant was issued for Childress for uh, failure to appear. And uh, with that arrest warrant, the court uh, cautioned that Childress being armed and dangerous. Then on 12-17-2015, the Arizona Wanted Violent Offenders Task Force began to attempt to locate and apprehend Childress and they gained the information that may, that Childress may be in Las Vegas with family. 12-29, 2015, the Arizona U.S. Marshals requested assistance from the Nevada U.S. Marshals to apprehend Childress. Then on 12-30, 2015, task force of U.S. Marshals they, and uh, uh, began surveillance on Childress. The task force inv involved two LVMPD officers and one NHP officer. On that day, the surveillance ended at 4 p.m. The next day, uh, New Year's Eve, 12-31-2015, uh, 
at 8.04 a.m. via phone. The U.S. Marshals contacted LVMPD Communications and set up a surveil surveillance at the Monaco Park Apartments. This uh, um, group did not have the LVMPD officers or the NHP officers because of their assignments for the New Year's Eve celebration for the Valley. And then the details in this that were given to our communication was that he was wanted and that he was listed as armed and dangerous with violent tendencies. At 1404 hours, which is 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, U.S. Marshals attempted to take Childress into custody at the Monaco Park Apartments. Childress ran from the Marshals and they pursued on foot and requested over dispatch uh, assistance from the LVMPD area patrol officers. At 1405, 205 hours, LVMPD officers in the air unit were assigned and went en route. Containment and perimeter began and uh, U.S. Marshals broadcasted that Childress was a suspect in an attempt murder case. 1416 hours, 216, LVMPD Sergeant Campbell broadcasted that a handgun was found in the vehicle that Childress was getting into when the marshals were attempting to take him into custody. 220 hours, the air unit located Childress, uh, uh, took over the radio traffic and guided officers into the area. Detective, if I could ask you to back up one slide, please. Going back to the 1405, so at 205, the information came out that there was an attempted murder case, is that correct? Yes, there was. All right. We just saw the warrants actually earlier. Attempted murder was not one of the actual charges, correct? That's correct. However, there was armed robbery, there was kidnapping, and other pertaining uh, violent felonies. That's correct. All right, so the information wasn't specifically accurate, but it did reflect uh, his potential use of a weapon. That's correct. Thank you. This overview shows the location where the air unit located uh, Mr. Childress. He was in the backyard, he was, uh, began jumping fences, ran along the fence uh, between the houses and then out into the street and ultimately on the, in front of the Gilded Crown address. 14, 20, uh, 21 hours, 221, uh, Childress walked into the Gilded, onto Gilded Crown Court. This is where Sergeant Bohannon was driving up in his vehicle and uh, other officers observed Childress in the street. And then at 14, 23 hours, uh, shots fired was broadcasted by officers. <clears throat> this is the uh, actual radio traffic of the incident from the time that the Deputy U.S. Marshal requested assistance for uh, the foot pursuit. This radio traffic is condensed. There are the dead spaces are taken out of it. Uh, these call signs represent the officers that were um, uh, involved during this. Uh, also in the radio traffic, you'll hear 413 stated several times, and that means handgun. That's the 400 code for handgun. And you'll also be able to hear the marshals advise the dispatcher that Childress was an attempted attempt murder suspect. This uh, the clip is about seven minutes. Control US 134. Copy US 134. I need to set up a perimeter. On an individual that just took off on us. Let me get you an address. US 134, what's your general location? Control US 130. Go ahead. 8300 block of Golden Cypress. Acknowledge. CP 39, if I may. CP 39, copy you. Call 1 and 2 off of the two line. Control 601, what was going on? U.S. 134 had a subject run. They're requesting a perimeter. We're trying to get people unit, unit out to Control 243. You can clear me. And Mary and uh, Simon Sapp, please. Call 3, copy. Control 601. What crime do we have? U.S. 134. Control U.S. 130. Go ahead. The subject is 444 attempt homicide. Acknowledge. Control 6495 main area unit, can I please? Being requested. U.S. Unit 649, I need a bit person description as soon as possible, please. Last direction of travel. We're going to. Air 3 is on channel. Air 3, U.S. 134 and U.S. 130 had a subject takeoff on foot. He's 440 for attempted murder. Address is 8300 Golden Cypress Avenue. 
US-130 control. US-130. Do you have a description and direction of travel on this guy? Confirm. Subject is 61, light skin BMA, wearing a red ball cap, black jacket with red piping, and dark pants brake. Was last seen northbound over the wall into 8345 Golden Cypress. Into the residence or just into the yard? Into the yard. US-130, what color is the pants I missed that? Dark colored pants. Do we know if the subject's armed? Unknown. Signal. Control 649, is there an ocean unit that's far away from this that can uh, pull over and uh, set up a perimeter for us, please? There are notion units that can assist on this perimeter, is that? Control 601, I can do it. 601, copy. Control 582, tell Adam I got the map up. Control 649. 649. Once we have the perimeter set up, I need a unit to make contact with the marshal unit that's out at the apartment. That uh, apartment where he ran from. They're out with Uncle Freak. And just for officer safety, there was a 413 that was located in that vehicle. So the subject does have or has had uh, connections with 413s. Hey, give me the radio, give me the radio. I got the suspect. He is in between that uh, Cypress Heights, walking back over. He's on top of the walls, going westbound. He's in all black with bright red shoes. He's walking westbound. I think I got a U.S. Marshal coming uh, into the backyard from the north on uh, that Cypress Heights or whatever it is. Okay. Okay. He's uh, back southbound. He's southbound. He's in between. He's going to be one street north of Golden Cypress, paralleling it. He's on top of the wall. He's going to go on the, the roof of the house here. Street gilded crown. So what is the second street, or the very first street uh, north of Golden Cyprus? Gilded Crown. K9 12, it's Azure Shores, and I'm arrived on it. They're, they're three, give me some numbers. Can't get on the radio. Turn left, unit 723, turn left, turn left. Go westbound, he's up here, five houses on the right hand side, he's gonna come through the, uh, down the middle of the street now. That's him on your right. He is not complying with the officers. He's walking away from them. He's walking westbound away from them. And he's at the end of this cul-de-sac on the south side. He's going up to that. We can't let him get in the house, guys. Okay, he's going up between the houses. They're going to lose visual with him now. He's right between the houses, guys. Take cover there. He's coming back out. He has a 413. He's got something in his right hand, I believe. That's a 413. Control Air 3. He is standing. I can't give you numbers right now. He's standing in between two residences. He is standing uh, just west of the second to the last house on this cul-de-sac on the south side. He's facing the officers who have cover uh, just east of him in the driveway, right? There is a small cul-de-sac that runs north and south. It connects with Golden Cypress. We need to get a couple units or a unit when we have them west of there for containment, right? Okay, the suspect's walking toward the officers. They're at the end of this cul-de-sac on the left-hand side. Shot fired. We got a shot fired. Shot fired. Copy, shot fired. I'll roll medical. Suspect is now in the driveway. Suspect's down in front of 8335. He's laying on his back. He is moving. Just be advised, he is moving. Last unit revised. Medical in route. Control 601. He dropped, he dropped the 413. Go medical. We're going to take him into custody. Acknowledge. Control 601, he's in custody. We're at 8335, whatever the street is. 
Copy. Can anyone confirm is it Asher Shores or Gilded Crown? We're on Gilded Crown. Acknowledged. 8335 Gilded Crown. Control canine 12. Suspect's in custody. Just be advised they did deploy the dog and he did engage the suspect. Canine 12, copy. Control, air 3. Air 3. Yeah, if you can put in the comments that uh, after he was standing in front of the house, he was, he was engaging the officers. He walked directly towards the officers. Uh, I was partially blocked on the, on the orbit, but he definitely was, was engaging the officers. Acknowledge. <clears throat> Detective, if we could go back to that side just one moment. Go back quick. Okay. So <clears throat> we heard a description of the actions and the movements of uh, Mr. Childress on this radio traffic. Predominantly, was that coming from the air unit, which is listed as Air 3? Yes, that's correct. So the air unit would be the helicopter that was flying over the top? That's correct. And was in a position to be able to be updating everyone else with the movement and the actions of the individual. That's correct. We also heard at one point about um, a vehicle and a 413 being found in the vehicle, is correct? That's correct. There are actually two separate locations involved in this investigation. Yes. In fact, what we're hearing about now is on Gilded Crown, but the car was actually back at the original location where the marshals had attempted to take the suspect into custody. Yes. Now, the marshals were not successful in doing that, and then Metro's involvement in this whole thing came after the marshals were not able to take him into custody and after the suspect ran from that scene. That's correct. And the scene that he ran from is where the vehicle was and where the 413 or the firearm was. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we pause for one second? I note that members of the audience are filming and you're certainly free to do the filming, but I will just note that this is a public proceeding and that an entire copy of the video will be available at clarkcountynv.gov, and I just want to let you all know that, um, that, that there is that, and you can download it, but again, you can, you can keep filming if you want. I just wanted to let you know that there will be a full video available of this proceeding almost immediately, and that way you didn't have to hold the camera up, to, just to let you know. Thank you. Sergeant Bohannon was wearing body cam, and uh, we'll go through a segment of that body camera. Uh, he was wearing the video or the camera on his left collar of his uh, uniform shirt, and he did have that on as he uh, responded. And this clip stuff begins as Sergeant Bohannon pulls into the street and up towards the street, and you'll be able to see Childress on the right-hand side of the, the, um, of the view and then it'll follow all the way through the shooting. Also, you'll be able to hear the Sergeant Bohannon's verbal commands and radio traffic from the uh, air unit and the uh, uh, other, uh, the officers that are uh, broadcasting, but particularly with Sergeant Bohannon's verbal commands. He gives uh, over 20 commands to get on the ground, don't walk toward us, and then the, the uh, shooting takes place. And during all of the verbal commands, uh, by Sergeant Bohannon and other officers. You'll be able to hear another officer uh, uh, in on this. It is Officer Walford who is next to uh, Sergeant Bohannon. But there is no response from Childress to these verbal commands. So Westbound, he's up here, five houses on the right hand side. He's going to come through the uh, down the middle of the street now. That's him on your right. Yeah, he's Let me see your hand, drop the gun! No, 
Off the gun! Drop your gun! Surrender! Drop your gun! Drop your gun! Drop it now! Drop your phone now! Guys, he has a gun in his right hand. Tell him, go the way they'll pay on gauges and rifles and such. Drop the gun! Drop! If you advance this, you will be shot! Drop your gun! Do not hold contact! Do not hold contact! This is a, a short segment of the Bohannon, Sergeant Bohannon's body cam in slow motion showing Childress walking towards the officer, looking directly at the officers prior to uh, the shooting. Before you play that, Detective, when he's advancing towards the actual officer, are they set up behind a, a vehicle at that point? Yes, both uh, Sergeant Bohannon and Officer Walford uh, and one of the U.S. Marshals are behind a vehicle, and then the, th the second U.S. Marshal is up against the house. And from the perspective of the video, as we watch it in just a moment, as Childress is approaching the officers, to Childress's right, is that the front door of the house that he was actually shot in front of? That's correct. Thank you. There's no audio with this one. This is a still photograph of, from the video, uh, showing Childress looking directly at the officers as he's approaching, and where his location again, right at the near the front door of the residence, and uh, the uh, double car garage. Go through the officers' positions and their perspectives. This is a crime scene photograph. The the cones indicate where. Uh, the uh, officers and Childress was located, Sergeant Bohannon behind the red car, the rear of it, uh, Officer Walford up by the front of it, and then the two marshals next to him near the front of the vehicle and the car, and then showing Childress's location uh, where he fell at the time of the shooting. Sergeant Bohannon's perspective over the, over the vehicle that you saw with the body-worn camera puts uh, Childress at approximately 15 yards. And the same with Officer Walford, just different position at the front of the car, again about 15 yards. And then the uh, Deputy U.S. Marshal number one, uh, uh, approximately 15 yards. And then Deputy U.S. Marshal number two, again at approximately 15 yards. This would have been Childress's perspective as he was walking. This photograph was taken right in front of the door where, the, uh, where he was standing at the time of the shooting. It shows where Sergeant Bohannon was. Officer Walford and the two deputy U.S. Marshals. At the time he was taken into custody, uh, officers found a cell phone in his right front pocket and a weapon was not found uh, on Childress or in the area. <clears throat> Officer Walford provided a written statement uh, to the uh, FIT detectives 
and in his statement he indicated that he heard Childress was wanted for an attempt murder, and that was broadcast again uh, on the radio. Officer Walford assisted with establishing the perimeter. Uh, he observed Childress walk toward officers with his right hand inside his pocket as if indexing a firearm. Childress refused to remove his hand from his pocket. Officer Walford was concerned Childress had a firearm due to the handgun found in the vehicle. Again, that was broadcasted. Sergeant Bohannon gave commands to Childress to remove his hand from his, from his pocket and drop the weapon. Childress walked between two residences, then came back out with his hand in his pocket. Officer Walford could see the item was black. Childress walked toward the officers despite Sergeant Bohannon telling him to stop. As Childress approached, Officer Walford was concerned Childress was going to shoot him and Sergeant Bohannon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public proceeding. Just we cannot have any comments from the outside. Please let the officers and the state present uh, their case here. Thank you. Officer Walford fired to protect himself and Sergeant Bohannon. And that concludes. Thank you very much. That concludes the presentation. Mr. Tomshek, do you have any questions? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, sir. How about now? Yes. Okay. Um, you used kind of some terminology that I would characterize as probably police talk that is the way you guys are trained to communicate. Fair? Yes. Um, you mentioned that you're on the FIT team. Yes. What does the FIT team generally do? We investigate uh, uses of force, all the officer involved shootings, categorical uses of force where there's injury or substantial bodily harm. Okay. And in fact, when you were testifying previously, you made reference to the term OIS. Yes. That stands for officer involved shooting. Yes. Um, I'm assuming when you conduct these investigations, you want to get as much information as you possibly can. That's correct. Um, and when you gave testimony previously, you talked about uh, specific statements that were given by witnesses to this event, specifically Officer Wolfer. You mentioned his statement, correct? That's correct. That's not the only person you interviewed? That's correct. In fact, you did a number of interviews? That's correct. And you do what you can to memorialize those interviews? That's correct. Um, they're recorded or there's notes taken, there's things so that you can go back later and look at the totality of the investigation. That's correct. Okay. Um, one of the other things you talked about a little bit when you were testifying a moment ago is the reference to a 413. Yes. Um, and, and just so that anybody watching this understands, when you're trained in law enforcement at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, there's certain 400 codes, as they're referred to, right? Yes. And that's so when you guys communicate, you don't have to say firearm, you can say 413, yes? Yes, that's correct. And that's what a 413 is. It's a, it's a reference to a gun. Yes. In that radio traffic, there's other 400 codes referred to, correct? Yes. Um, in fact, they say at one point in that radio traffic that the suspect is 444, correct? Uh, in, in the radio, it says it's 440, okay. the number 444, attempted murder is what it said. What does 440 stand for? A uh, wanted person. Okay. So when the members of law enforcement are communicating, they can say 402, 405, 415, whatever it is, and you all know what that means. That's correct. Um, all of that information on that radio traffic is available to all of those people you had up on that slide, correct? That's correct. So there's deputy U.S. Marshals, yes? Yes. Um, and in fact, that's who's initially involved in this situation. They're trying to take Mr. Childress into custody because he's 440 or wanted, yes? Correct. Ultimately, they're unsuccessful in doing that, so Metro assists in this process. At their request, yes. So the, the U.S. Marshals actually broadcast, hey, we need some help. We're trying to get this wanted individual, and we can't get him into custody. That's correct. Okay. Um, there was reference to an air unit. That means someone who's up in a helicopter, right? That's correct. And all of those individuals are sharing this communication. That's correct. 
it's pretty obvious in the radio traffic that at some point it's broadcast that Mr. Childress is wanted for an attempted murder charge. Did you hear that? Yes. And in fact, that's corroborated by witness statements when you ultimately interview people. That's correct. Was he ever wanted for an attempted murder charge that you know of? No. Um, you'd agree that that was an error in the broadcast? Yes, it was by the U.S. Marshal. Okay. Um, ultimately, there was a number of charges that he was wanted for, correct? Correct. Uh, what were they? Um, I have to go back to that slide to list those if you'd like me to. Sure, if you can. I don't have access to do that, but I just want it to be clear. Burglary in the first degree. This is a second, class two felony, and again, these are Arizona charges. Two counts of armed robbery, two counts of kidnapping, two counts of aggravated assault, and two counts of theft. And from the information you've reviewed, these are the charges Mr. Chose was convicted of in Arizona approximately two weeks prior to this incident. That was when the uh, arrest warrants were issued, was on that 12-17 date. Okay. And again, just so it's clear, attempt murder is not one of those charges. Correct. Okay. Included in those charges are certain components that involve the use of a firearm, however. That's correct. And that's information that was made available by the U.S. Marshals to Metro in that radio traffic. That's correct. Okay. Um, in your review and interview of witnesses in this case, did it appear to you as if law enforcement had a concern about Mr. Childress having a firearm at the time they encountered him? That is correct. And in fact, on that radio traffic, it is broadcast that there is a firearm found in a car he had been in. Fair? That's, yes, that's correct. Okay. When you do an investigation where an officer discharges his weapon, you walk through a process uh, called a countdown, that's right? Correct. Yes. Can you explain what that means? <laughs> Yes, the, uh, the officer's uh, handgun is uh, taken from them. Uh, it is uh, photographed, and then the weapon by our crime scene analyst, it is photographed, and then it is taken, the, the magazine is taken out, and the, if there is a round in the chamber, it is taken out, and all of those rounds are counted to determine how many, uh, according to what was capable of holding in that magazine, to what was fired to help determine how many rounds were fired. So it's essentially to do a, an accounting of how many rounds there are and how many are left so you can know how many rounds were fired. That's correct. And it's also to, to match up what is found on the scene as far as the cartridge cases. In addition to doing a countdown of the firearm, you also do an inventory of non-lethal force that officer might have in their possession as well, right? That's correct. In this particular case, did either Sergeant Bohannon or Officer Walford, the two individuals who discharged their weapons, have non-lethal force available to them? Uh, they would have had at least pepper spray and a baton. Uh, I'd have to look through the re uh, back into the report to see if they were either carrying tasers uh, or um, also. Is that something you could find readily in your report? Yes. They were both carrying tasers also. And in your investigation, did you find any evidence that any method of non-lethal force was attempted prior to the discharging of the weapons? It was not. 
we saw a video in your PowerPoint presentation of Sergeant Bohannon's body camera. Yes. Um, did Officer Wolford have a body camera? He did have a body camera, but he did not activate it. In other words, it wasn't recording? Correct. Um, do you, did you conduct an investigation to see whether any of the deputy U.S. Marshals had body cameras? They did not. So is it your testimony that the only available recordation of this event was Sergeant Bohannon's body camera? The video recording, yes. I believe that's all the questions that I have. The public has offered some questions, if we can approach the presiding officer. We have received a number of questions from the public. I'm not sure if this witness will know the answer, but we will read them. Uh, this is a public inquiry, and the best we can to make sure that the questions are asked, we will do so. I'm going to mark them as in numerical order, and we'll start with what's been marked as number one. Sir, why would the officer broadcast an order and order him to drop the weapons when you can clearly see that he has a cell phone? In all of the radio traffic, uh, uh, the officers believe the officer, or excuse me, Sergeant Walford believed there was a handgun. Uh, and that information was broadcast that they had access to a handgun. And through training and experience, uh, officers are trained if there is one handgun, there's a possibility of two. Um, but he never did see exactly um, through the radio traffic that there was a gun. Uh, he was, and we did not have information from the sergeant that he actually did see the gun, other than the radio traffic. Question two from the public. Is it true that the weapon that was located in the vehicle belonged to the family member whose house he was at, and that was established before they pursued him? Uh, that is not correct. It, well, it's correct that it was his handgun, but it was the information, uh, again, was broadcast at the time that the weapon was located that uh, uh, Childress had access, possible access to a handgun. But it was not his, Childress's handgun, it was the family member. Question three, why did the officer only call in for lethal measures? <coughs> why wasn't the dog released when there was one on scene, but the canine was released only after the shooting at the time that he was down? The dog was released as the canine officer approached. Um, the, again, the, through the video and radio traffic showed that the officers gave Childress every opportunity to stop, to go to the ground, put his hands up, and he chose to continue walking towards them. Again, this time frame is very quick from the time that the officers made contact with him up to the time of shooting it was about a minute and a half. Question four from the public. Why was he shot multiple times when he was shot with a 45 and went down with the first shot? No marshals fired a shot. Uh, that is correct. No marshals fired a shot. Uh, officers are trained to, sh to shoot to stop the threat. Uh, those two officers determined that the threat continued and they fired until the threat was stopped. Are there any further questions from Mr. Tomshek or members of the public? There have or been, Mr. Pesci. There have been some additional submitted questions, if we can approach again. Please.
Okay. So that it's clear to members of the public who may be watching this, we've received ten questions. I've marked these as Exhibit 5. Um, there are a number of them that I'm not going to ask as worded. However, I'm going to provide them to the ombudsman whose job is to represent both the family and the public, and if he believes it's appropriate to reword the questions and ask them, I will give him that opportunity to make sure that everyone uh, is able to ask the questions they believe are appropriate. We're going to ask number two on their list, this is two of five, or two in, on Exhibit 5. Sir, what could have been done to de-escalate the situation to avoid using lethal force? The verbal commands that were given by the officers that were on scene were clear. The only other way that it would have stopped of using force is for Childress to stop, put his hands up, and go to the ground. This is question six. Sir, can you identify the name and department and the position of the person or persons that relayed the information or misinformation of the attempted murder suspect? That was broadcast, broadcasted by uh, the, one of the U.S. Marshals. This is number eight. Can you explain how a command to drop the gun could have been complied with if he did not have a gun? Uh, that was one of uh, over 20 commands of uh, dropping the gun, and, uh, but he was also given the commands to stop, to put his hands up, to go to the ground, which are also clear uh, commands to stop. Number nine, did any officer ever command him to drop the cell phone? Uh, no. Number 10, how do you know he could properly hear the commands from that distance from the officers? I don't know that, uh, uh, the, how I would know, but from 15 yards away, officers yelling, it's uh, probable that he could hear those, I had no problem. Okay. I'm going to provide the rest of the questions to the ombudsman, who's going to review them and determine what he believes are appropriate to ask. Detective, from your review of all the witness statements, the body camera, the radio traffic, et cetera, um, you would agree with me that at the time he was fired upon, Mr. Childress did not have a weapon? Correct. Of any type? Correct. Ultimately, it was your determination that the item that Sergeant Bohannon believed to be a 413 or a firearm was a cellular telephone? That's correct. After he was fired upon, Mr. Childress was put into handcuffs, correct? Correct. And at that time, there was a cellular telephone in his pocket, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the The cellular time. telephone was in his pocket, correct? That's correct. And it was removed by officers? That's correct. You would agree with me that your review of the video doesn't show him holding up the cell phone or pointing it at officers, correct? That's correct. In fact, it appears as if his hand is in his pocket or near his pocket at the time he's fired upon. That's correct. At the time this incident took place, there was a air unit above him, yes? Yes. There was a canine unit there on scene, yes? Nearby, yes. In fact, the canine unit was actually sent towards him after the shooting. That's correct. From your review of the evidence and interview of witnesses, it doesn't appear as if the canine unit was discharged before the firing of lethal force. It right? was not. You would agree with me that it would be inappropriate to use lethal force if the officers didn't have a real belief that their lives were in danger. Correct. That's the way they would have been trained. And I'm paraphrasing some of the questions asked by the public, but you'd agree with me a cellular telephone isn't capable of deadly force? Correct. Nothing in your investigation revealed that Mr. Childers had any issues with his hearing. Fair? Correct. I have no further questions.
If I could follow up. Uh, Detective, a moment ago you were asked about the perspective of the officers and that their lives, um, that they thought their lives could be in danger. During the air traffic, did we also hear an indication of the air unit to make sure the individual did not get into one of the homes? Yes. In addition to the fear the officers had for themselves, was there reason to have fear of other individuals that could be in harm's way based on his actions? That's correct. And what was that fear? Uh, in a resident area, several houses there, and uh, where he went between two houses and then came out and was walking towards the officers, which is also towards the front door of that, that residence where he was shot. Thank you very much. I just have one question. What's the range of the tasers that the officers were carrying? Pro approximately 25 feet. 25 feet, okay. Does anyone have any questions that were not presented? I believe we have one. We'll wait, let that question be presented to Mr. Tomchek. We've received another question. We're going to mark it as number six. Is it true that there's other footage that shows Keith on the cell phone and the sergeant even makes reference to him being on the cell phone? No, that's not correct. Are there any other questions that have not been presented? I have one follow-up question, if I could. Please, Mr. Tomchuk. The video evidence that we saw in the PowerPoint presentation is from Sergeant Bohannon's body camera, correct? Yes. To your knowledge, is there any other video recordation of this event from any law enforcement source? No, there is not. Do either side have any follow-up questions? No, thank you. No. This public fact-finding review was held because the Clark County District Attorney's Office made a preliminary determination that no criminal prosecution of the officers involved in the death of Keith Childress is appropriate. Clark County Ordinance Chapter 2.12 requires a public review following such a determination. The purpose of today's hearing was to present the public with the essential facts surrounding the death of Mr. Childress. Josh Tomchek was appointed by the Clark County Manager as the Ombudsman to represent the public and Mr. Childress' family. Mr. Tomchek was given an opportunity to ask questions to provide the public with relevant information regarding the use of force in this case. I was appointed by the Clark County Manager as the presiding officer to preside over this public review. I, too, was given an opportunity to ask questions to provide the public with relevant information regarding the use of force in this case. Prior to today's public review, the Clark County District Attorney's Office provided to Mr. Tomchek and myself copies of the law enforcement investigation regarding the death of Keith Childress. The documents provided by the prosecution are considered public record unless some of them are protected through a protective order. If you missed any portion of this review or would like to obtain a recorded transcript a video of the entire proceeding is available on the Clark County website at www.clarkcountynv.gov. This concludes the Police Fatality Public Fact Find Review into the death of Keith Childress. Thank you.